After Vladimir Lenin died in the early 1920s, Russia was governed by a committee of Communist Party elites called the Politburo. This was kind of how Marx envisioned communist, communism working. There wasn't one particular individual, but a committee who made all of the decisions as the transition process happened and the state could wither away. The Politburo really governed by this committee because they weren't sure what else to do. Lenin was gone too soon. The revolution had not been secured. They maintained many of Lenin's policies, most importantly, the NEP, the new economic program, which you will recall is big communism and little capitalism, which Lenin had used quite successfully to pull Russia back from the brink of economic collapse. Within the Politburo across the 1920s, however, a rivalry formed between two men, Joseph Stalin and Leon Trotsky. We have met Trotsky already, and I'll talk more about him in just a second. Let me introduce you to Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin was a pretty reserved and quiet guy. He was a young man at the start of the revolution and had embraced the communist cause. And in many ways, Stalin was a beneficiary of the Russian Revolution, much the same way Napoleon was a beneficiary of the French Revolution. Joseph Stalin was the son of Russian peasants, and although he was incredibly intelligent and very talented, without the revolution, he would have had none of the opportunities that came to him in his life because of the revolution. And so, uh, he joined the communist cause, he was a fighter, but really Joseph Stalin's talents lay with uh, organization and working in the details. And he came to the attention of the party, he rose through its bureaucratic ranks and became an important secretary to the communist party, keeping records of everything and came to the attention of Lenin, who was really quite impressed with this young man. Now, Trotsky, we have met before. Trotsky was incredibly important to the Russian revolutionary cause from its inception. He was a right-hand man to Lenin. He could fire up a crowd. He was a gifted military leader and strategist. And Trotsky, by all means, was really Lenin's more natural heir. He was certainly much more well-known and he had a much bigger personality than Stalin. And I would say early in the years of the Politburo, Trotsky perhaps had uh, the upper hand on that particular, in that particular organization. But his fortunes were kind of running out. Now, Stalin and Trotsky agreed on a few things. And most importantly, they agreed that Russia had to get off of the NEP that the new economic program, and especially its little capitalism, endangered the larger Marxist revolution. They saw this most importantly in the formation of a prosperous peasant class called the Kulaks. We'll talk about them a little bit more later, but they were all eager, both eager to move away from the NEP. Trotsky and Stalin's primary difference revolved around whether or not to spread the revolution. You will recall when we studied Marxism that Karl Marx envisioned an international movement. He was really discouraged by nationalism, Marx was. And Trotsky was really an advocate of this international brand of communism. He wanted the Russians to spread the revolution. And he saw, and he was right, that uh, the countries, especially in Western Europe, and this especially Germany, were ripe for revolution, that all the Russians really had to do was stoke the fire. And Trotsky believed it was their obligation to do so, and Trotsky believed that the time was right. Stalin disagreed. Stalin and his supporters adopted a slogan called socialism in one country, socialism in this case in Russia, that what they needed to do in Russia was to focus on firmly establishing communism in Russia. Stalin embraced nationalism and used it to his advantage. 
when he needed to, Trotsky abhorred it, and Stalin vehemently disagreed that the time was right for the Russians to worry about spreading the revolution. He thought that they needed to focus a little bit more um, on themselves, on the interior. Throughout the 1920s, the Communist Party in Russia engaged in a series of purges, purging something, getting rid of it. And this is exactly, the word meant exactly what it sounds like it meant. Under the, these purges were carried out at the direction of higher ups within the Politburo and Stalin became hugely important in this. Um, and they were carried out by secret police and the purges purged members of the Communist Party. They did not purge regular people. They purged members of the Communist Party, members of the Communist Party who were not communist enough, members of the Communist Party whose loyalty was questioned, who needed to be made an example of. The purges were a means of ruling by fear. In the Russian purges, especially those directed by Stalin, people simply disappeared. They perhaps went to concentration camps, um, political prisons called gulags that were opened in the Siberian part of Russia, or they were executed and their bodies disposed of, or they were sent into exile. Um, as the 1920s went on and Trots, uh, excuse me, Stalin gained the upper hand on the Politburo, Trotsky became a victim of one of these purges and Trotsky was exiled to Mexico. He had lost his power base in Russia. Stalin exiled Trotsky for the same reason Lenin spent such a long time moving the royal family around during the revolution. He didn't want to risk them becoming martyrs or a rallying point or a focal point for any who would oppose him. So Stalin had Trotsky exiled and he went to Mexico where he was murdered in 1940, almost certainly under Stalin's orders. Something I want to call your attention to right here before we move on is how important secret police and this idea of the purge is in these kinds of revolutions, okay? In these kinds of revolutions. Go back to the committees of public safety and the reign of terror where most of the victims were members of uh, the revolutionary class, okay? Those who had, who had supported the revolution. Um, in Hitler's Germany and in Mussolini's Italy, the use of secret police and fear and the purging of members of the fascist party was a very important component of their demonstrating and solidifying their control. Rule by fear, you better not even be questionable. Okay, Mussolini had a group of thugs he called his black shirts that he used in a very public way to beat people up or to kill people and to make an example out of them. Hitler had a, a group of secret police called the SA. They were known in the common lingo as the stormtroopers. You know, George Lucas and Star Wars, I guess, isn't all that original. But the stormtroopers carried out purges uh, according to Hitler's wishes, members of the Nazi party. The most significant one occurred in the uh, early 1930s. It's called the Night of the Long Knives, Great Night of Violence, or Hitler's purging his quote unquote enemies. But these enemies are almost always members of the own party. You're making an example of them. So even though communism and fascism were philosophically opposed and ideological opposites and inherent enemies for those philosophical and ideological reasons, they relied very heavily, both did, on the use of secret police and fear to maintain, uh, to maintain order. Joseph Stalin wasn't Trotsky and he wasn't Hitler and he wasn't Mussolini. He wasn't a great charismatic speaker who could command the attention of large audiences and just talk for hours and rile up a crowd. He wasn't a man of eloquence. He wasn't a speaker. He wasn't a great writer. And um, so he really relied on propaganda to promote a powerful and really quite benevolent image of himself. Historians call this Stalin's cult of personality. And Stalin invested heavily in a kind of art 
called socialist realism. Now, socialist realism is kind of a funny oxymoron because socialist realism is propaganda. There is nothing realist about it, nothing at all. Um, but you see here in this painting, here's a benevolent Stalin applauding his people who are cheering for him. Look at how happy the people look. Look at the flags flying. This is strongly nationalistic. And Stalin used images like this all over the place and all the time. And not only visual art, socialist realism could be um, music or it could be theater, it could be all different kinds. And in the socialist realism, and we'll end up seeing a couple of more pieces of this in this PowerPoint, you know, Stalin is the benevolent father figure of his people. We're going to back up a little bit and go back into uh, some of the policies of Lenin and the early revolution, aside from the NEP. Lenin really pursued a very aggressive and immediate transition to uh, communism in after he had seized power, the Bolsheviks had, had seized power. And this included the abolition of private property and the uh, full equality of all people. Marxism is predicated upon the idea of the abolition of class. And this is incredibly important. And so along with the abolition of class, there had to be the abolition of other kinds of divisive lines present in society, whether those divisive lines were ethnic or racial or gender based. And so the Bolsheviks implemented an immediate policy of the full equality of all people. Very important. Russia. Um, does have and the Slavic countries have people of, of different ethnicities and races uh, and this included the equality the full equality of women the full equality of women to work and the full equality of women in terms of marriage and divorce and the right of women to use birth control and to obtain abortions in the 1920s artificial means of of birth control were being uh, advocated for the first time and their use in many of the western democracies was discouraged or made illegal for married couples um, and abortions were certainly illegal even though as a medical procedure uh, were were practiced there they existed as i would say as a medical procedure and so one of the immediate rights Russian women gained was, was his right to birth control and this right to abortion. And this is part of their, their, full, uh, their full rights of equality. Now, Lenin and the communist um, policies of equality worked much better in practice than they ever did in reality because behind closed doors, people didn't necessarily treat each other equally or even in public necessarily needs to be behind closed doors but people even if the law was equality people didn't treat each other equally and, and so when people's social interactions those more uh, old school common traditional boundaries remained but here was an effect of lenin's legalization of birth control and abortion was that across the 1920s the birth rate and marriage rate rates in Russia plummeted. They fell precipitously. Now, this wasn't necessarily a result of women being like, woohoo, I don't need to get married now and I don't need to have babies now. This was a result of just the trying nature of the times, especially the trying nature of the times from an economic standpoint. Um, and trying economic times always drive down marriage rates and birth rates. But by the 1930s, by the early 1930s, this had become an impending emergency for Russia. Their birth rate had fallen so dramatically that Stalin was compelled to take really, really um, 
grand steps, if you will, to reverse this. And coming short of forcing women to have children, uh, this is essentially essentially what he did. They adopted policies to encourage marriage, which were somewhat successful. Um, he did mitigate the full equality of women when it came to the workplace, even though women were afforded greater work opportunities than they were in Western countries. Um, uh, but he made the use of birth control and the practice of abortion heavily illegal in Russia. I would say, you know, if you've got degrees of illegality, it was more dangerous to perform an abortion in Stalin's Russia than it was to perform one in New York City or in London, where they were also illegal. But a doctor who is known to perform abortions faced very, very serious criminal penalties, perhaps up to death. Was this out of Stalin's moral goodness? No, it was not. It was out of an impending emergency in their population if Russians did not increase their birthright. Now think about what Mussolini and Hitler did too. They really strongly promoted uh, traditional family roles and they really strongly promoted high birth rates among their citizenship among their citizens, um, actively encouraged it. And they were very, very successful at uh, kind of making it a matter of social pride to have a lot of babies. This did not work out so well in Russia. You know, things were pretty difficult. They were pretty miserable. And so while Stalin's policies mitigated the falling birth rate to an extent, um, his attempts to up the birth rate were not nearly as successful as those in Italy and in Germany. Stalin's domestic policy centered around a group of plans called the five-year plans. And there were three five-year plans and obviously they were to be pursued in order. But the five-year plans called for the rapid industrialization of Russia and the formation of collectivized agriculture. So we've kind of been talking about this with Russia for a long time now. Um, Stalin implemented his first five-year plan in 1930, 1931, somewhere right around there. And the first thing that this did, it was it reversed the NEP. It took away the new economic program and it fully abolished all rights to private property or private business. It aggressively pursued rapid industrialization. Industrial cities sprung up in Russia out of nowhere overnight. And if you look at the five-year plan simply in terms of industrial output, they were remarkably successful from the first one to the last one. They were remarkably successful because the Russians did indeed finally significantly increase their industrial output. Stalin made Russia an industrial power. So that's only if you're looking at the numbers though. This came at a very, very, very high cost. Uh, workers were paid very low wages if they were paid at all, because we have to remember this is communism. Um, working conditions were dangerous lives were expendable and uh, they were difficult. Conditions were incredibly difficult. There were constant housing shortages. Sometimes more than one family had to live in a small apartment that was owned by the government, by the Communist Party. And so in a word, while industrial output increased significantly, you had a pretty unhappy and miserable population. There was a lot of alcoholism, there was a low birth rate. We've talked about, about some of those things. Um, also, the types of things that were produced were heavy machinery for industry and for agriculture, uh, airplanes and tanks, railroad cars, not consumer goods not things to make a person comfortable, not clothing, not pillows, etc. items for the home. And so things were still pretty miserable, even though if you look at it from an output stance, the five-year plans were quite, were quite successful. 
collectivization, not so much. Collectivization proved incredibly difficult and was not something that was successful in Russia for the first, throughout the 1930s, I guess I would say. The idea of collectivization or collectivized agriculture is the formation of these very, very large government-run farms. And you think about industrial agriculture that would have huge output of grain and and everything would work according the peasants would know here's what you're going to plant and here's when you're going to harvest it and this was all owned by the government nothing was owned by people individually and these would be huge and think back to what marx and engels advocated in the communist manifesto the formation of industrial and agricultural armies this is what stalin is trying to do and you kind of spread them out across the country so you don't have the concentration of workers and industries like Western Europe was seeing as they industrialize. So I like this cartoon. Here's Stalin. You always know it's Stalin because he's got the pipe and he's herding the peasants onto these large farms. These were huge affairs. Uh, most of these collectivized farms would have as many as a quarter of a million to a half a million workers. So I mean when we say big large scale farms, we're talking about very big large-scale farms. Now, you can measure the success of industrialization under the five-year plan by output. You can measure the failure of collectivization by the lack of output. The peasants resisted. The peasants resisted collectivization. They were not on board and it was a disaster, especially at the beginning. And it's a really sad situation where the peasants resisted collectivization the best they could and the government pressed on anyway. They weren't gonna negotiate. They weren't going to have any of it. Now, this Kulak, this Kulak class, uh, the Kulaks were a group of property owning prosperous peasants. And the Kulaks had emerged as beneficiaries of Lenin's NEP. Um, the most important part of the NEP was to allow peasants to sell excess produce for profit and to own their own land. And a group of peasants uh, called the Kulaks had done very well under this. And as you might imagine, they resisted collectivization the most strongly because they were losing their land. All the peasants were losing their homes, but they were losing their land and they were losing their, uh, their wealth. They were forced out of their homes and onto the collectivized farms by soldiers at gunpoint. And you can see here in this photograph, a Kulak family leaving their home with a small number of belongings in their cart. This picture depicts an anti-Kulak rally uh, with regular peasants. It's being led by a communist and they have their, their scythes and their other tools of agriculture and they're condemning the Kulaks. The regular peasants didn't necessarily like the Kulaks. They resented their success and it was pretty easy to kind of use like a class-based warfare against them. That being the case, even though the government had the peasants not liking the Kulaks, the peasants in general themselves resisted collectivization. Okay, so uh, knowing that the peasants not, didn't necessarily like the Kulaks wasn't really helpful in making collectivization a success. These farms were in designated places. A lot of people had to move and they had to move by force. They had to leave their homes and the things that they had, even if they didn't really own very much or anything of their own. And the peasants resisted by refusing to cooperate. They resisted by refusing to grow the food being requisitioned by the government. They resisted by destroying things. They, they, this is a very Russian idea. They destroyed their tools of agriculture. They destroyed their seeds. They destroyed their stores of grain and other things. They uh, killed their livestock rather than let the government collectivize their animals, their goats, their, their sheep, their cows. 
they killed them. They destroyed their own livestock. They destroyed their own beasts of burden, their oxen and their horses, so that the government couldn't take them. And this ended up being a disaster. This ended up being a disaster. The, the forced collectivization in the early 1930s led to a series of famines across the 1930s, artificial famines, man-made famines. Um, these, were just, these were created not out of drought or floods or any other kinds of natural disaster, but by the conditions that existed in Russia themselves. Uh, the peasants refusing to cooperate with collectivization the government coming in and by force requisitioning any agricultural produce that was produced because obviously people were still growing grain and um and generating food and um leaving the peasants to starve there just wasn't enough food produced yet again and this was a disaster an absolute disaster for russia Stalin mitigated the effects of the famine by importing grain from Poland and some from Germany and even from the United States. And this was a tremendous uh, embarrassment to him to have to do this. But the Russians had to import grain for many, many years following attempts at collectivization because this policy started so badly. Um, but the peasants were left to starve. You can see here, I know this photograph is very poor quality, but the horses have starved to death. You can see their bones. Um, millions of people, millions of people starved. The best estimates, and it's a guess, because for many, many years, nobody knew the full extent of this. You know, the, the communist government didn't advertise this problem. They didn't ask for help. And so it was a situation that people outside of Russia could kind of guess at, but didn't really know for sure. And you can see here this Russian peasant woman and her small child who is starving to death. Estimates, really good estimates, conclude that somewhere between three and four million people died in the 1930s from starvation as a result of these artificial famines. The famines were worst in the Ukraine the Ukraine was part of Russia and what would become the Soviet Union at this time. That's never been a happy relationship. We know it's not a happy relationship right now, but the Ukraine is a breadbasket, some of the most fertile agricultural ground in, in the world. And collective, collectivization, um, ground zero was in the Ukraine. It was, the, it was where collectivization was most prominent and where the famines were the worst. And Stalin punished the peasants who resisted, you know, by taking the food. There was intentionally, when agricultural requisitions happened, they didn't leave food for them. The government came in and took everything. And the results were severe. The results were severe. Contrast that reality to the collective realism, I'm making my air quotes, socialist realism, excuse me, of this piece of pro-collectivization propaganda. This is what people in the cities were seeing. This was kind of the official word. Look at these happy, healthy peasants who are doing their part to establish the um, communist society in Russia via collectivized agriculture. Very, very different from the reality. By the late 1930s, Joseph Stalin had established himself as the undisputed dictator of Russia. He was absolutely brutal. He dealt very harshly, as we saw with the peasants in the Ukraine and elsewhere in Russia who resisted collectivization. He did not hesitate to purge his political enemies or even people who weren't his political enemies but could still serve as an example he carried out a number of purges through the 1930s he ruled by fear uh, he did not make examples of beating and killing in public in stalin's russia people simply disappeared and and perhaps that was the most terrifying um aspect of of his rule by fear 
Um, he had a number of political concentration camps called gulags in, in the Siberian tundra. We'll talk more about them after World War II. Um, he ruthlessly pursued industrialization and he established a fully communist society in Russia, um, but not one in which the state was withering away, one in which the state was becoming ever more powerful and ever more present in people's lives. Stalin was seen by England and the United States and the French and others as an important counterweight to the rising power of Adolf Hitler in Germany. Both men were seen as dangerous, but both men were also seen eyed by the West with a little bit of relief that each one would keep the other in check.